Alan's about to give me a green, yeah, green light. Okay, there we go. Um, hello, and thank you for everyone for being here tonight. Um, we are welcoming the poet and writer, very prolific writer, Diane Glancy, uh, to my ad as the first in our series of celebrating writers, poets, um, musicians, all kinds of people to celebrate then as now, Woodland Pattern 1980 to 2022, which is a 40 year retrospective, actually a 42 retros year retrospective of everything we've done in the visual arts across this time. It's wonderful. Um, and Anne Kingsbury and Carl Gartang are here tonight. They are the founders of Woodland Pattern and they are the ones who started this off and ran it. Is 
not the same with writing that begins with Terry? Is it not the same with travel? Aren't projects a moon that keeps the earth from tilting too far one way or the other in its orbit? Isn't the moon scared, scarred by craters from the comets that hit it? I'm going to have to get my other pair of glasses. Hopefully, I will be able to see the words. Isn't the moon scarred by craters from the comets that hit it? Yet it holds its own in the sky. Does not the moon change the shape of its stories? Isn't it only visible where the light of the sun hits? The earth often is in the way. Maybe the moon is angry. What does it know of itself? No more than a clay vessel with a mouth. The thirst and the need for water is our source of life. I think of the shapes that do not fit, and orbits and movement, and in them is the shape of my own being. Yet I keep trying to make a unit of these indecisive pieces. In the church I went to as a child, I heard stories about how Jesus came as a fisherman sometimes awkward as a clay vessel full of water, the two handles on each side too small for my fingers. I heard this story, but not in the words they said. I heard Christ was a wayfarer and a transgressor who came to tear up the world. The gospel was full of water. It kept us afloat. Jesus walked on it sometimes under the moon. In his travels, he made the gospel. My ears were shaped like handles when I heard Sometimes I see how far away I can go to see if I can get it back. The next piece is for Carl, because the Rokansas is mentioned in it. After I returned from Callister, I taught other places. I was at Azusa Pacific in Los Angeles County for two years, and I would make these long trips back. It is 1,555 miles from the duplex in Monrovia, California, to my house on the eastern border of Kansas. It's uphill all the way, at least as far as Flagstaff. Then I-40 descends into the Great Plains. At the beginning of the trip, not 50 miles east of the duplex, California rises from nearly sea level to 4,257 feet at Cajon Pass. I see the highway head up the mountains the trucks growling like herds of slow, lumbering animals. At Barstow, there's a road sign, Wilmington, North Carolina, 2,554 miles. I'm not going that far. Traffic on I-40 turns like electric windmills over the high desert, the trucks and cars moving east and west, except several out of step, turning a little slower than the others, their blades up when everyone else is down. Now there is snow on the mountaintops. The altitude of Flagstaff is 7,335 feet. Now down into the fat, flat slab of the southwest through eastern Arizona and New Mexico with a rise and fall into the bowl of Albuquerque. On the second day of Tucumcari, New Mexico, I cut northward on a single lane highway 54 across the upper corner of New Mexico, across the panhandle of Texas and Oklahoma into Kansas. Somewhere on the back road, I heard a radio preacher talk about angels and cherry hymns. All day I drive behind cattle trucks and a line of long distance carriers through scattered small towns with 40 mile an hour speed limits. It's 400 miles from liberal Kansas, Carl, on the southwest edge of the state to my house in Chinese, Kansas, on the northeast edge of the state. I pass a train carrying new windmills, disassembled. The long hump blades are a pod of whales along the railroad track. I pass a line of oil cars like round hogs on wheels. Lord, I am plain as alfalfa, subtle as hay and straw. My magic wand flickers and goes out. My wild horses have run away. My cow, my chickens follow. I want to say hallelujah to lift my exuberance. I love the drive from California back to Kansas, the first day at least, from Los Angeles to Tucumcari on the interstate. Before the second day turns to endurance, my words begin to burn. Someone touched them with a match. It's those cherubims all wired up. The 
excuse me, Lord, for following you so closely. I've read the driver's manual, a car lane for every 10 miles an hour, the vehicles aren't moving. Lord, the brush clumps make the road swift and breeze with your grace. I need your radiance, O oh God, of whom the world was not worthy. So there you are, car of the world is mentioned. And I picked up some leaves. We don't have these kind of leaves in Texas where I live now and on the walk. I picked some up. I will put them back in my book. Several years ago, I made a film, an independent film. Many people do that. It was called The Dome of Heaven. And the dome is the sky over Oklahoma. You can see from one edge to the other. The film was about a young, girl who wanted to go to college despite all the poverty of her family and low self-esteem. Making an independent film I have wanted to make. Dreams are dangerous. They uncover your bones. They bleed you. Dreams are a swarm of insects, I remember, on a summer evening moving over the yard. They fly independent of one another, yet belong together as a group. Their cohesiveness is in their brokenness, hovering on the edge of darkness and back. My aunt Martha Petitore has died. I divide her estate between the six nephews and nieces. I receive a portion, not enough to make an independent film I have wanted to make, but to start, to get into it. She was an I shall not be moved Christian. She and Uncle Luke had no children. They lived a quiet, sparing life. That was her word. We must be sparing. They were married over 50 years when Uncle Luke died. They would not approve of an independent film. I can hear them say, do not use our money for this. But I have a dream, a vision. Now I am thinking how to get into this. Off the gutter of the porch, drifts of rain fall on large wet leaves like the snap of fingers or like a rock in the tire tread that makes a steady snap when the car is on the road. I begin to feel a rhythm. There's an energy coming. Something is going to happen if I can step into it. Everywhere I go, I think how to do this. I wake at three in the morning. What am I doing? What has caused me to do this? I don't know how to make a film. I don't know how to direct. There are other places that need the money, that I need the money. Where did this dream come from? Senility at the end of my life. A wrong turn into the grandiose impracticality. But in the Psalms, as elsewhere in the Bible, which I read in my stress, I find the impossible can be accomplished. So much against it, funding, funding, and funding are the components of filmmaking. But things begin to fall into place. People are willing to act in it. People are willing to donate. I purchase the insurance, consider the budget. I still wait with the mystery of how it will be met. I am needy, I am needy. Psalm 109.22. This is a supplication of anyone making a film. I read Conquest of the Useless, The Making of the Fitz Carraldo by Bernard Herzog about the difficulties of filming, including his attempt to move a steamboat over a steep incline to the river on the other side. My parents and former husband would tell me I can't do it if they were here. I know I'm up against something more than I can do. I visit my brother. Do it before you won't be able to, he says. Do it while you still can. Do it before I forget which side of the road to drive on. In November 2009, one month before filming, I am on my way to Byside, Oklahoma to find location. I-35 south from Kansas City, then west across Oklahoma, usually an eight-hour trip. Along the road, I see the hedge apples in a tree, like a flock of birds in its branches. They are that same swarm formation I remember in the insects. I decide December 7th through the 14th, 2009, we will shoot what we can. One actor has to leave the 15th, another actor had to leave the 16th, another can't arrive until after the 7th, another can't arrive until late on the 8th. The airport in Oklahoma City is three hours away. That is six hours for whoever picks them up. I don't have drivers, I don't have a camera crew. I return to Kansas City and then drive to Byside, Oklahoma again. 
the Dewey County Sheriff and the Assistant District Court Judge agreed to be in a film. The Bysai High School principal says I can film there. The Public Relations Officer at Southwestern Oklahoma State University in Weatherford says I can film there. I visit the Bysai Nursing Home to ask if I can use a room for Franklin's hospital scene. It is pouring rain. They agree. I visit the Bysai restaurant and ask if they can provide meals in their back room. They can. Chicken fried steak or chicken fried chicken. Housing is more difficult. There are no motels in Bysai. The closest ones are 30 miles away in Sealing and Woodward. What if it snows? What if it's overcast while we are there? I think of all the lovely days that have passed since I have wanted to make this film. Now I get into it again at the last part of the year, probably the worst time to make a film. In Weatherford, Oklahoma, I stand at a fence on the north end of 7th Street, looking back toward Bysai, where Flutie wants to run from college when she is afraid. I stand there at the rusted gate before I feel her with me, before I feel the rusted fields of Oklahoma's red soil in the distance. I see the wind bending the row of weeds by the fence, hissing through a gnarled tree and the spruce bush. I leave Oklahoma in the afternoon to drive back to Kansas City again, some eight hours away. The sandy roads seem like hands that pull at the car. This was the great salt plains uh, near Jet, Oklahoma. The sandy roads seem like hands that pull at the car. I hurry over the wettest places to get through them. I see the return of clouds on the western horizon. The prospect of filmmaking is getting sucked into the wet, sandy soil of the road. But I wait morning seeing the scenes and hearing dialogue. Filmmaking is a stroll on the sea. Filmmaking is a calling out. What are you looking for? What do you want? Jesus asked in John 1.3. I want to make a film. I want to go to Bysight, Oklahoma with $40,000 of my own money and another 20,000 in donations and savings and make a film that will cost at least three times what I have. I have been in contact with the Screen Actors Guild because I wanted to use five of their actors. Sang emailed me the low budget contract, 39 pages. The printer ran out of ink before it all printed. I can't handle this, I emailed back. They sent an ultra low budget contract. I signed it and returned it to the agents. How could I tell, I'm gonna skip some of this. The film is based on the myth of Philomela, whose brother-in-law raped her and cut out her tongue so she couldn't tell. She wove the tapestry of the event and sent it to her sister, who knew then what had happened. The sister cut up their son, fed the pieces to her husband, and fled. When he followed them, the women turned into birds and flew away. Sometimes she built a story on a story already told. Rape is not an issue in the film, but the inability to speak is. The story of Philomena wrestles a story from silence. It makes silence speak the need to tell our story. The myth of Philomela became a roadmap through the film as Flutie began to speak from her silence. Once on my way to Oklahoma on I-35, I stopped to film a field full of hay rolls. A red-tailed hawk flew to the fence right in front of me. It sat there until the noise of an approaching truck made it fly away. It is the tailpiece in the film. It did hold still while I filmed it. On the last day of November 2009, one week before I wanted to start filming, I still was without a film crew. I drove to Lawrence, Kansas and talked to some young men who had just graduated from the University of Kansas Film School. They said they can't get ready, ready that fast. I keep talking until I have a film crew. They will arrive in Bison on December 7, 2009. After the first few days of filming, he later told me the crew had a bet they would have to pack up and return to Lawrence, Kansas, but we did not abandon the film. I rent a four bedroom house outside my side where I stay. The first night a cow breaks the wellhead. We are without water. There are five of us in the house. I wake at four in the morning. It is below freezing. I hear sleet against the window. And that day we had to travel down to Toloka to the courthouse. The next day, at a house in the country, the second one I rent, the toilet won't work. I rent a portable one, which they set in the front yard where we needed to film while we are going for lunch. 
It is bitter cold, zero degrees, with a wind chill below zero as we stand in the yard. Now a mower we need for a scene won't start. Now there is not time to finish shooting the scheduled scenes before dark. Each day I ask, what disaster will it be today? But each day there also was a magic. We shoot until December 14th when I packed up. I took one actor to Norman, Oklahoma to visit a friend who would take him to Oklahoma City Airport the next day. I drive back to Kansas City in the dark for eight hours. There were a few cold nights in Blyside when the sky was clear. We stood in the yard in the dark, looking at the canopy of stars over us. Not even a yard light to hide the sky from the open land that disappeared into the nothingness until we were standing in the constellations. I remember once raising my hand as if, as if touching their pavilion. We returned for the second and last week of filming, April 11th to the 16th, 2010. This time it was the wind that was the weather. I remember after the cemetery steam, helping a lady with a cane back to the car. For every two steps forward, we took one back. Each day there was forecast for possible rain. Heavy clouds passed, but rain did not fall the first four days of the week. On Friday, the clouds opened and rain fell the entire day. The last night of filming, the cast and crew went to a cafe in Sealing to eat and celebrate. I went back to the house to pack because once again, I had to take one of the actors to the Oklahoma City Airport the next morning for a 7.30 flight. I was crying anyway. Filming was over, what was the matter? It was the absolute relief I felt. I remember that I had plane tickets for the actors before I had the film crew. I thought of the disasters that could have happened. I think of the past, past of trauma. I felt afterwards for, was from the realization that I had been through a war, a war on a minute scale, of course. I felt the weight of the heavy task of filmmaking. There wasn't the satisfaction of finishing a book, but a near disaster, as if I had touched something bigger than myself and somehow it had not devoured me. The process of filmmaking had accessed the wounded, the hurt and hidden places, something like driving long distances on the highway. I had to borrow money to meet the payroll the first week. I visited the banker. I had funds, I said, but it would take too long to roll them over. I received a loan of $15,000 to finish the film. I'm not reading all of this. As it turned out, the editing of the film continued the struggle. It felt like a multitude of puzzle parts all out of order, floating loose in the air. I had an editor. I made trips to Lawrence, Kansas over the next three months to watch him work. We had to cut many scenes from the script because of funding. During filming, I had stayed up late at night, working out the budget. I had gotten up early while it was still dark to write scenes to bridge those we had to leave out. During editing, it was hard to piece the story together, but he did it. Also, Flutie's story was my story and a composite of many students I had had over the years mainly when I worked for the State Arts Council of Oklahoma in the 1980s. Now seeing the story once again before my eyes, it brought up all that I had buried, like salt water from the underground ocean that is mentioned in the film. On the edge of eyesight, there's an iodine plant that extracts salt water. You can smell the underground water when you pass. You know, water once covered the Great Plains of America, and it's still there, but it's underground. And they dig for iodine in the great salt plains where we were filming. You can smell the ocean. It's really cool when you're out in the middle of the prairie. We had a screening of the film at the Visai High School Auditorium. I could not have made the film without the townspeople. The Randalls provided the soundtrack. They acted in the film. The Visai banker drove to Pittsburgh, Kansas for a 1944 coup. When I needed a red dress for Geneva's wedding, I had five dresses to choose from by afternoon. In a town of just over 700 people, whatever was needed, needed the people provided. So it is now. <clears throat> This book is about my travels, Home is the Road. 
And I was going to read a piece about going to the No Dabble North Dakota pro pro protest, excuse me, out of the pipeline, but I think that's enough of reading. So, are there questions or comments?
over this flat Oklahoma land for this little tiny rise. So the dome of heaven. I don't know, maybe it would have a better name. But anyway, it's sort of amateur. It really takes a million dollars to make a low budget film. And I have much less than that. I had a lot of people. Wes Studi is in a who's a Native American actor. He's been in a lot of movies. Dances with Wolves. And he lowered his prices because he said, I like to work. And he wasn't doing anything at the time. And I had SAG actors, professional actors. Oh, and you all came to visit in Oklahoma. You were at the, what was that junkyard called? For the Custom cars are big in Oklahoma, and there are all these custom car shows. So everybody came with their custom cars around Oklahoma, <laughs> and we had a custom car show in the film. Okay. So, okay. so thank you all for coming. I appreciate you being here. You were great students today, by the way. <laughs> <laughs>